Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game Orléans, designed by Reiner Stockhausen and published by Tasty Minstrel Games. Medieval times were full of various tradesmen, knights, scholars, and monks, all looking for someone to guide them successfully in a great purpose. Which ones will you call upon and what tasks will you assign them? That's the decision only you can make as you strive for supremacy in Orléans. So join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place this game and beneficial deeds board in the center of the playing area. Now have each player pick a color and these matching components. A player board, bag, seven wooden markers, ten trading stations, one merchant, and their starting set of four followers. These you can identify because they'll show your player color on the bottom portion of the token. You then place these into any of the empty spaces found here on this area of your player board known as the market. Also have each player put their merchant onto the map in the city marked as Orléans. On the first space of each of these character tracks have the players put one of their colored wooden markers as well as on the start space of this development track. These are the hourglass tiles. You should shuffle and place them in a face down stack on this space of the main board, placing this lighter backed one on top. These character tokens should be sorted by type and then stacked onto the space that shows a building at the beginning of the matching character track. These are technology tokens and they should be placed in this area of the board right here. Mix face down these goods tiles, and then randomly draw one to place face up into each of these spaces found on the map. Some spaces are marked with either three or four. You only fill those in if you have at least that number of players. I'm setting up for a two player game, so I'm going to leave them empty. All remaining goods can be flipped face up and organized into stacks that you'll place on these marked spaces found here on the board. These are the double-sided citizen tokens which should be placed on any areas of both boards marked with this symbol. It doesn't matter which side you use, just fill in all of the spaces, including here and along here, leaving one left over that you should place nearby that you'll use at the end of the game. There are several different place tiles. You don't have to shuffle these, but separate them into two piles based on their backs and put them nearby. Put the coins nearby as well, and then give each player a total value of five of them, and pass the start player token to the youngest player. If you're playing with less than four players, on page three of the rules, it indicates a certain number of followers and goods you are to remove from those already placed. I'm setting up a two-player game, so I'll make these adjustments here. And that's the setup. In Orléans, you'll be collecting a variety of different followers, putting them in your bag, which you'll draw from later, to be able to use for various tasks. Collect the correct variety, use them wisely, and you'll have a chance at gaining dominance in Orléans. The game is played over 18 rounds, broken into seven phases each. In phase one, the player with the start token will flip over the top hourglass tile. There are 18 tiles in this stack, so you'll know when you're in the final round once the last one is revealed. The tiles will show one of six different types of events that are resolved in a later phase, so in this way, you can see what's coming. And we'll discuss their effects during that phase. In phase two, you'll check the markers on this farming track. Right now, they're on the same space, so let's pretend we're a few rounds in, and we'll even temporarily add a third player. Whoever is farthest on the track will gain one coin from the supply, unless there is a tie for most, and then no players gain a coin. The player farthest back on the track will return one coin they have to the supply. If you don't have a coin to pay, then you must suffer torture, which will be explained later in this video. If there's a tie for last place, no one has to pay a coin. In a two-player game, you do not lose a coin if you're behind on the track, but the player ahead still gains one. In phase three, each player draws a number of character tokens from their bag equal to or less than the number showing above their marker on the knight's track. At the beginning of the game, this will be four, but you don't draw any followers during the first round because your bag is empty. Over time, the bag will fill up, and then in future rounds, followers you draw from it are placed on the empty spaces of this market track. Just keep in mind, you can never draw more than you can fit there. For example, if I already had these followers on the market and was able to draw four during this phase, I could only draw, at most, two followers from my bag, as that's all that I have space for. 
Phase four is planning, where players simultaneously assign characters from their market onto matching spaces found on their player board. Your player board is divided into various labeled locations that represent actions you can take once you've placed followers on all of the spaces. For example, to take this castle action, I'll need a farmer, boatman, and trader placed here. During this phase, you can assign your followers to any empty space. You don't have to complete all the spaces of an action, and you don't even have to use all of your characters if you want to leave some in your market for use in a later round. As I said, this phase can be completed simultaneously by all of the players, but if you feel you need to know where someone else is going to assign followers before you lock in your choices, you can request the players perform this phase in turn order, starting with the first player and then going clockwise around the table. This is not an unusual occurrence, especially towards the later part of the game. Now it's phase five. Starting with the first player and then going clockwise around the table, each player will either take one action or pass. But once you pass, you can no longer take actions that round. Otherwise, players will keep taking actions around and around until everyone has passed. You may only take an action if you have its follower spaces filled in with characters. And once an action has been resolved, you remove those followers and place them back into your bag. You can carry out actions you have available in any order, and you can even choose not to take an action even if the spaces are all filled in, saving it to perform on a later round. But now, let's learn about the various actions that you can take. This here is the shipping action. It allows you to move your merchant token from its current location along a blue water path to the next connected town. If you cross over any number of goods tiles, you may choose to take one, placing it beside your personal board. Goods are worth points at the end of the game, which we'll see later. The wagon action works the same, but instead you move to the next connected town following one of the brown roads and collecting up to one goods token that you cross over. If you take the guild hall action, you may take and place one of your trading stations in the town where their merchant is currently located, as long as there is no other trading stations already there. The exception to this is Orléans, where each player may have a single station. With this castle action, you take a knight from the board here and place it into your bag, and then advance your marker one space on the knight track. Now, in future rounds, when drawing followers from your bag, you'll be able to draw more. The blue player, in this case, can now draw five. The first player to reach this spot then takes this citizen tile, which will provide points at the end of the game. And while here, players still draw seven followers as when they were in this spot. The farmhouse action gives you a farmer token from this stack for you to add to your bag. And then you advance your marker one space on this track, which then provides you with the good shown at that space. Simply collect that tile and then add it to your collection. When you complete the village action, you'll be able to collect and add to your bag either a boatman, craftsman, or trader. If you take a boatman, advance your marker one space and then collect the number of coins shown there. The first player to reach this final space won't collect any coins, but they do take this citizen tile. Taking a trader advances you one space on this track and then you can expand your city by choosing one of the place tiles. The first space restricts you to choosing a tile from the stack marked one, but future spaces allow you to choose from either of the stacks. Keep in mind, you do not randomly draw from these stacks. Instead, you freely go through them to pick the one that you want. Placing the chosen tile beside your board will provides you with a new action that you can take in future rounds by placing your followers there. Some will let you gather goods or money or a variety of other effects, which I won't go over in this video, but you can find clearly explained here on page 10 and 11 of the rulebook. If you use the village action to collect a craftsman, take one and add it to your bag and advance one space on this track, collecting one of the technology tokens as shown to place beside your board. When you eventually pass during this phase, you may then place it on an empty action space, like this. For the rest of the game, you will no longer need to place followers in that position to complete the associated action. For example, by putting it here, now I'll only need to put a boatsman and a farmer onto these two spaces to take the castle action. When I then complete that action, only the followers are taken and returned to my bag. The technology will stay there to continue helping me in future rounds. However, if you look closely at the symbol shown here, the first technology tile you collect must cover a space that would usually take a farmer, 
like this one. After that, any technology tiles you take can then be placed on any space with a few exceptions. First, you can never place them on top of spaces that show a monk, or on an action that already has a technology tile, or on any action that would normally only require a single follower in order to activate. Remember, you do not place a technology token when you first collect it. Instead, just set it aside, and then when you pass during that phase, then you can put it on your player board. And also keep in mind, once placed, they cannot be moved. Taking the university action gains you a scholar to place in your bag, and then you advance one space on this track, gaining a number of development points, as shown, which you then track by moving your marker here. Any time that you move onto or over a space showing coins, collect that amount from the supply. If you're the first to reach or cross over a space that has a citizen token, you collect it. These are development status spaces. Whichever one you have most recently crossed indicates your current development level, which will affect a few things, including your points, at the end of the game. At the beginning of the game, players are considered to have a development level of one. This is the monastery. Taking this action lets you add a monk to your bag. Monks can later be put on any space in place of any other follower token. For example, if I wanted to take the guild hall action, but during the planning phase I only had a farmer and a craftsman, I could use a monk from my market to cover this night space. Well, monks can replace other types of followers, other followers can't replace monks. So for this particular action, only a monk could be placed here. Taking this scriptorium action simply advances your marker one space on the development track. The town hall action is unique because any type of follower can be placed on either of the two action spaces. And this is the one action where you don't have to fill both spaces in order to take the action on your turn. But when taking the action, move either one or both of the followers there and place them on any matching free spaces on the beneficial deeds board. For each place, you gain the indicated reward of the deed, which is usually some coins, or on this deed, it's either a single coin or development point. The player who places a follower that would fill in the last space of a particular deed then gains the associated citizen token. Keep in mind that unlike other actions, you have to use the exact follower when filling in a space. This means you cannot use a monk in place of another depicted character, and you also cannot send any of your original four followers, the ones that have your color on the bottom, to the beneficial deeds board. So those are the actions, but keep in mind a couple of restrictions. If your marker has moved to the final space of a track, you may no longer take the associated action on your player board. You also can't take an action if it would require you to collect a follower and there are none left there to take. Some events might return followers to the supply, at which time those actions can then again be taken. Also, if the coins ever run out, you cannot gain more coins until some are returned to the supply. But you can still take actions that would normally give you coins, like performing a beneficial deed. I should mention, at any time, you're allowed to look in your bag and see what workers you have left remaining in there, but just make sure after you check, you mix things up well. Now it's time for phase six, where you will look at the previously revealed event tile and resolve it. Now I mentioned there's six different types of events that can come up. Let's go over each of them right now. If it shows a plague, all players randomly draw one character from their bag and return it to the game board. But you do not move your marker back on the corresponding track. Also keep in mind you cannot lose any of your initial four followers, so if you draw one of those from the bag during a plague, lucky you! You can return it to the bag and you are unaffected. If the event is trading day, each player receives one coin for each trading station that they've built. If the event is income, then each player gains a number of coins equal to their current status on the development track. So here the green player would receive two coins and the blue player would receive three. Unlike other events, when a pilgrimage is revealed, it's resolved right away, preventing players from recruiting monks during that round's action phase. If the event shows taxes, each player pays one coin for every three goods they have. So in this case, the player would pay one coin. If you don't have the coins required to pay, you must undergo torture, which we'll explain in a moment. If the event is a harvest, each player must pay either a single grain, cheese, or wine good. In this case, the player has a cheese, which they can return to the supply. If they can't pay one of the listed goods, they must pay five coins instead. 
And if they can't do that either, they must undergo torture. Anytime you must pay coins but can't because you've run out, you're required to fulfill torture, replacing each coin you cannot pay with any combination of the following. A trading station, one you've already built, or one from your supply. A development point, so long as it would not move you onto or past a space with coins. A goods token, a place tile, or a technology token. Or a follower drawn randomly from your bag though you can't lose your starting followers, so redraw if you would have to. As an example, if I was short paying three coins, I could choose to lose two goods and a development point. Except for development points, anything paid through torture is removed from the game. After resolving the event, it's on to the final phase where the start player token is passed clockwise and a new round begins. At the end of the 18th round, and again, that's the round in which the final event tile was revealed. The final citizen token, the one that we set aside earlier, is given to the player who built the most trading stations. If there's a tie, no one receives it. Now it's time to total your score, and you can use these icons here at the top of the board as a reference, or pass these around to the players to help out. As you can see here, each coin is worth one point, and goods tiles are equal to the values shown. Then you add any trading stations you built to any citizen tiles you collected and multiply that by your level on the development track. As an example, if I had built three trading stations and collected four citizens, I would add that together for seven and then multiply it by my level on the development track, which in this case is five, for a total of 35 points. Whoever has the most points wins. And in the case of a tie, the player further ahead on the development track wins. If there's still a tie, those players share the victory. Now there are just two other rules we should quickly go over. Once you place followers on spaces, they have to stay there until you use the action. Unless, during the phase where you draw followers from your bag, you choose to draw less than you would be allowed. For each you did not draw, you can return a follower from an action space back to your market. In this case, I was allowed to draw four, but only drew two. So I could choose to return up to two followers if I wanted to. Finally, there's also a variant for advanced players. At the start of the game, beginning with the first player and going clockwise, each may go through and take any place tile and return it to the game box, excluding it from play. In a two-player game, each player removes two tiles. And that's everything you need to know to play Orléans. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until next time, thanks for watching.